Michael Orr, Blindside, story continues. We have, uh, I mean, I assume that everybody knows what's <laughs> happening right now. Uh, what you laughing at, man? I'm laughing at, I, I can't imagine two names in a story that are harder to pronounce than Michael Orr and Tui. Tui, yeah, is that how you say it? Michael like, Orr? The, well, I mean, I think the you first time you it, saw okay. it, right. yeah, O H E R and T U O Y. There's an H in there, huh? Yeah, oh, obviously O her. Mm. Yeah, the apostrophe Twoy. make it Irish. O her. <laughs> <laughs> well, they owe him. I mean, <laughs> yeah, he surely thinks so. So the Tui's made a statement yesterday, right, Jess? Uh, yeah, which I pulled up, and then everyone started screaming, so now oh, I have to scroll yeah, down sorry. and That's find it. We're testing mics because uh, I've noticed in some clips that we put out there. Spike Lee over here. People people peak. Yeah. Are we still peaking? I, I have a headache. We have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> that one got it from you guys testing mics. That one actually peaked, so for whatever uh, reason, you didn't get that loud the last time we peaked, so we're going to have to Peaking duck. <laughs> uh, tails. You proud of that? Yes. Red Woo! tails. <laughs> yeah, so they came out. So, <laughs> what was the statement? Red Grange. <laughs> What's their family name again? The Tuies. Tuies. Yeah. So the Tuies. I can uh, recap what happened. So, like, I have the statement now. Okay, Great. there we so go. Great right. Right. for everybody. This is from ESPN. It says uh, <laughs> their attorney Martin Singer said, "In reality, the Tuies opened their home to Mr. Orr, offered him structure, support, and most of all, unconditional love." They have consistently treated him like a son and one of their three children. His response was to threaten them, including saying that he would plan a negative story about them in the press unless they paid him $15 million. Uh, and it was also described as a quote-unquote shakedown. So yesterday when we talked about this, I was a lot uh, more cautious about indicting the Tuies in any way. The statement made it worse. Like, the statement made it worse. It leans into all the white savior trope yeah. things, and it makes it feels like, feel like Michael Orr um, owes them a, a debt of gratitude. Like, none of us were in this whole, uh, the whole experience that they had from the time they met him to the time that they're fighting with him now. However, what we can say quite clearly is that they all benefited from being near Michael Orr in a bunch of ways. It is strange where what they're, what they're saying, not kind of saying, what they're saying is we gave him a home, we showered him with love, and in exchange, we took advantage of them. <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of what they're saying. That's kind of what they're saying. So, like, so it's a fair it's a fair trade. He shouldn't be complaining about it now. So, I, I feel like this is should be an open and shut case because all of the things that they're talking about are like connected to legal documents that can be found. If he was in a conservatorship, yeah, then they can find out whether that happened or not. And also, like, the the contracts that they sign to sell the book rights uh, and for the movie and the back end, like, there's disputes on how much they got, but ain't that in ink somewhere? Well, there's actually a paper trail for a lot of the things going on over here as part of the alleged shakedown that the Tui family uh, accuses Michael Orr of uh, enacting. He refused to cash uh, checks that they wrote for him because they weren't the sum that he was looking for. And also, something that can be backed up, I'm sure, by documents is, despite that, they claim that they deposited his equal share into a trust account that they set up for his son. Right. So I'm sure that can be documented. Yeah, so it seems like it should be easy. I'm not sure what all the confusion is about, but uh, there's a couple different reports. Right now, it seems like they're saying that the money that they received was uh, 250000 or two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for each of their kids, and then two percent of the back-end profits from the movie, which the movie made three hundred and nine million and cost twenty-nine million to make. Now that sounds very benevolent, but if you're sending an unjust amount to uh, Michael Orr and he's refusing to cash it because he thinks it's not fair, does it make it better that you're still sending that un uh, unfair sum of money to his son in a trust just to cover your tracks? I, I think what we do know about this is that. All the way to Hugh Freeze, Michael Lewis, the Tuies, everyone has Nick benefited. Saban. Nick Saban. He's in the movie. Depose Nick Saban. Let's get him on the stand. I have a few questions for him. Everyone has benefited from this, including Michael Orr in some way. I don't know that he benefited from the movie. Like, you don't draft players because or Ozzie Newsome, of all people, is not going to draft somebody because he was in a movie. Michael Orr is a great football player. He was already in the league when the movie came out. Yes, right, I know, but the story was. was out. The New York Times article was the out. Book the book wasn't. was out. Yeah, but Dominic, it's his story. Yeah, and that's, I don't there know. There is no story yeah. without Michael he, Orr. He wasn't like, in the pros when the book first came out. 
Uh, I, you mentioned people getting deposed potentially. One of the things that has come out about all of this, and I'm sure a lot of people view this film now in a different light, given what's happened. Some people <laughs> maintain this very same light that they viewed it under at the same time, which is, how did she win that Oscar? Yeah. Come on. Uh, <laughs> but one thing that we learned is Michael Lewis and Sean Tui were childhood friends. Exactly. Which... Dum, dum, dum. Yeah. You know what? This sounds like Moneyball. Of a certain <laughs> variety, and and Hugh Freeze went from being a high school coach to uh, oh, embarrassed. Well, he's probably not embarrassed, but disgraced pro, uh, college coach. I almost said professional, which would have worked also. And I think that's the part that's incredibly well, it works now. yeah. <laughs> that's the part that's incredibly uncomfortable for me. Is it's obvious that one thing that's true about Michael Orr's story was he wasn't in a good situation, and he, like a lot of kids of many races, are in bad situations. He's one with a unique talent that they noticed when he entered this, this um, uh, religious school, and they all seized on it. And I, I'm of two minds. Like, okay, you see some, a kid who has a special talent, and you want to help him out. But it seems like it all ends up benefiting them. He goes to the school that, he go, that, that um, they both graduated from, the two he's graduated from. And then Hugh Freeze works his way up from high school coach to, professor, or to college coach, making lots of money. Then he makes lots of other really bad decisions and it just all feels so gross if it's a truly benevolent act i'm not so sure that everyone needs to benefit from it the right. two is going to give uh on a speaking circuit making money off that releasing yeah, books it I, just all I, feels I, I'm gonna tell so you what. disgusting i'm gonna tell you what like i'm not even mad about going on a speaking circuit or whatever but it's like if you really cared about this kid and his gift and like he, your own kids yeah and you took him in and then he went on and have a great career or whatever like why is there a profit maximization on top of that, right? Beyond, you know, hey, people want to talk to me. If they want to talk to me because yeah. it's a cool story, that's uh, speaking game. That's cool, but it's like, hey, I'm going to sell the story. Hey, I'm gonna. It's gonna get option and be made into a movie. Hey, we're gonna be friends with Sandy Bullock and all that. Like that's the stuff that layering on top that's clearly exploitative. That's the part that kind of looks like. Come on, you said is is this is this good Christian values here? You know, it's quote unquote because that's what they always hide behind people like this. They hide behind like this is good Christian values. I did a deep dive on all their Instagrams when this stuff came Ooh. out, and the oldest daughter is an influencer now. There's absolutely no way that she would be an influencer without this story. And the mom is a motivational speaker. Every single one, the son's in college football. Every yeah. single one of them have they've profit. all benefited. Yeah. yeah, like immensely. Right. Also, not a good account. Wasn't worth a follow. <laughs> <laughs> but Dominic, you brought up a point earlier that I think is why this phenomenon exists in the first place, which is that it's a feel-good story for white people to right. really like. See, they really embody this like white savior. But the stereotypes in the movie, even when it came out, like I was barely, I wasn't even like an adult yet, and I remember being like, right. "This is like really reinforcing a lot of stereotypes." But I guess everyone loves this movie, so yeah. I should like it too. And it was. Like the the son who's like six teaching him the right. rules of football with condiment bottles, like that sort of thing. Or, or Sa Sandra Bullock and showing him the dude was like already a D one prospect. Yeah, I think like, he was he played he was a he was not an intellectually challenged person, no. which is what they portrayed him as, and that's why I mean I think there should be a lot of heat on the Tuies for this. I think there should be a lot of heat on the whoever wrote Don't the screenplay for the movie, whoever directed the movie, whoever saw the movie and produced the movie and was like, yep, this is great. We should definitely put this out there. But movies like this still get made today so it's not like it's a, a thing that stopped happening after 2009 and they're coming for sandra bullock's oscar of all things <laughs> like I, I mean i don't care about that nearly as much but yeah they i was reading about the movie i never watched the movie because i mentioned earlier i was on the team with michael and he said he hated the movie so i was like all right i don't need to see it and the reason he said why he hated it was like they make me look stupid and in, he at the point i knew him he's uh, not stupid in a weird way this is the chris cody theory in a weird way is this good for the movie for the blind oh, side. Yeah. Because people are going it. back and watching it. Oh, now. the blind side yeah. is already it's one of those movies that's on every flight oh, that you will it? ever take. It's one of it's like Moneyball in the blind side. Every single <laughs> flight I've ever been on, that has been an in flight movie option. For some reason, because there's you know, it's it's not a explicit movie. It's yeah. something yeah. that's quote unquote family friendly and it's a feel good story, but it really only makes white people feel good because they think they're Doing some sort of charitable activity. What did you do to end racism today? I watched The Blind, I watched the blind Side <laughs> on my flight. It is such a good thing. You know what? Racism? <laughs> Problem over. solved. Yeah. Yeah. Over. You're, you're done. The Tui's have seen of that. Also, the name Tui makes you think of Suey. 
Yeah. Like, hey, like two E's. They we, rhyme. When they people, the well, when people say the two E's, I was like, oh, yeah, I, I won like six two E's that one year. <laughs> I, the, I, I, I helped a black kid go to school and then <laughs> the um the the like movie an, an award for ending racism for white people <laughs> i think um bomani did like a, a racist it's movie award yeah. thing on his show that the uh, broskers right yeah, has, Boskers, yeah Boskers? it's getting its run on the internet right now because he called out that movie uh before we come around to it but uh, reading about it the racist scenes that you're talking about, there was one where I read he said they taught him how to use a bed. And the movie, the end of the movie is about um, the gang leader in the neighborhood that he grew up in, like making Leanne Tui feel sexually uncomfortable. And Michael like defends her and it's like <laughs> suggesting like on a, on a trope that has caused a lot of people in the South to lose their life about like the oversexed uh, Mandingo. That's a very serious topic. I'm glad we're talking about it, but I want to go back to taught him how to use a bed. Was he like, like this? Is this how you do it? I don't know. I did see the movie, but uh, at a certain point, at a certain point in his life, he was homeless, and so they have to teach. I mean, and this is the article I read that they had to teach him how to use a bed in hey, the movie. It's just ridiculous. Hey, he's like, all right, makes his bed. All right, ready, ready for bedtime. <laughs> Lays on the floor. I like this bed. It's just not comfortable. It feels really hard. I don't know why. Like I got all the pillows on it, but. Taught him how to use a bed? How dare you? I saw a tweet from someone who works in the service industry in Memphis, and she was like, the Tui's suck, and I hope yeah. they get what's coming. And I know they did it, because if you're mean to service workers, <laughs> you did whatever you're accused of. Allegedly. Especially service workers on Twitter, because God knows nobody likes to make up a story. <laughs> <laughs> the um doesn't uh the dad the dad was a basketball player at Ole Miss and I think he like does some sort of broadcast stuff in association with the Grizzlies like they're all heavily into sports and like the name matters. I mean the thing is no matter what the real story is here the fact that this movie exists is the crime am I right <laughs> like we could argue over all of the finer points to it but this was an abomination. I, I'll let you slide Jess because I believe you, but. There's a lot of people talking trash about this movie who freaking loved it when it was out. Is, is this how you use a bed? <laughs> all right, movie time with all of our... We have all of our movie friends in studio. Well, all not movie. in studio, but on air right now. We have the king of all movies, David Sampson. He really has the best movie opinions. And then Verk also hanging out in the Zoom. And Amin El Hassan, the prince of poorly made films. Is that fair? Uh, sure. Although I do have opinions on good films as well. I know, but I feel like uh, the movies that the are... The bad movies yeah, are, that's, that's are like your you, wheelhouse. You, you've got a niche there. It's like yep. I do. I do. I have I've quite a profitable niche as well. What are you I doing know. to Adnan so early on here? Like calling Sampson the king of movies. Nah. You I, gave Adnan nothing. This, this is what we're doing right now. We're properly motivating Adnan because Good. he's coming after David. David always goes first with his list. So, David, what's our list about today, and can you give us a start? And hey, bud. Hey, how you doing? Good. Well, we celebrated Steve Martin's birthday on Monday. Hard to imagine he's 78. So I figured, why not come up with a top five list of Steve Martin comedies? And the key word here is comedy. Steve Martin, in addition to being a prop comic and being in movies that are comedies, he also does serious movies. So we're sticking to just comedies, Virk. If you can okay. possibly hurry up and Google that to get your list ready. <laughs> My list is prepared right here, Sam. So I'm ready to go. And as always, it's much better than yours. But go ahead. Lead us off with the inferior list at number five. Number five, all of me. Huh. Wait. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Even I, for, I was on vacation. I forgot how these things go. <laughs> Even the fanfare was staring blankly at you. Exactly. I don't Even know that the movie. I mean, wasn't a fan of the movie. Go I don't ahead. know that movie. I'm sorry. Uh, I've never, first time I'm hearing about it. I've yeah. never. No, Steve, Steve Martin has some good physical comedy, but it's ridiculous to put it at number five. Go ahead, Samson. Mike, it shouldn't matter if you've heard of the movie. No, uh, yeah, you no, that's on me. Title, you hit the button. Look, it went off me, Coach. I'm sorry. Lily Tomlin. He apologized. I got, hold on. Um, I got a tweet notification. Now, now you've done number five. Train for season. Just because I don't want to, I don't want to cloud uh, the airways with too many sounders. I'm gonna go ahead and lay this one out. Just, I feel like it'll cover the rest of the list. Please, please don't bring him down the house. Please don't bring him down the house. Please don't bring him down the house. Cinephobe. <laughs> Episode, uh, give me a second. <laughs> Go ahead, David. Number four, buddy. <laughs> Number four, P. 
Pink Panther. Oh. Uh. If you don't laugh when no. he asks for towels for room two for falling through the ceiling, then mm. you don't know what funny is. Mm. But this is outrageous. There's <laughs> one Pink Panther. It's it's Peter Sellers. Thank it's you. not Steve Martin's Pink Panther, which is vastly infer. I mean, back me up. This is a Roberto joke. Roberto Benini Steve would Martin like a Pink word. The, yeah, uh. this is this is it's outlandish and it's quite frankly offensive that you would take the <laughs> remake of a classic that should have never been remade. By the way, yeah. They just shoehorned Beyonce into it, too. His list, I mean. Bad list, Stu. Go ahead. Number three. So far. (laughs) Three Amigos. That's pretty good. Now we're talking. Co-written by Randy Newman. Three Amigos with Chevy Chase and Steve Martin and Martin Short, the latter two who are still working together in a great Hulu series called Only Murders in the Building. There are some scenes in there uh, that I don't know if they play today, although I just watched it in the bathroom at Rocco's Tacos <laughs> in Fort Lauderdale, what? where it's on loop, which oh. is great for a man of my advanced age because I spend a lot of time in there. <laughs> D- does have one immortal line, I'll fill you so full of lead you'll have to use your d- for a pencil. <laughs> I'm not sure how well it holds up now. <laughs> I love that movie, man. You can't see oh, it. It's man. a sweater! <laughs> Number two, The Jerk. Excellent. It may not be a movie that you can admit that you laugh at, but any (laughs) movie that has the opening line that it does, uh, it was made, it was funny, it was interesting, it was thought-provoking, and it's a comedy, and it's called The Jerk. It was made is uh, <laughs> is one way to describe it. Stay away from the cans. He must hate these cans. <sighs> Simple minded country boy suddenly decides to leave his family home. Oh, you've never watched The Jerk? You've never. Oh, dude. Oh, the was, opening wait, line. Have you yeah. Never heard of the, jerk? the opening no, line. I've heard of the I was jerk. Born. No, 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 no don't, don't ruin it. Don't ruin it. For any, it is a great opening line. At we least watch the beginning of the movie just to see the opening line because it is amazing. Kind of like a reverse <laughs> blindside situation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've heard The Jerk, but I don't think that it's something that I need to yeah. or want to watch, but I, I'll watch yeah. it. Actually. Just the first line. The Jerk is a right tackle. Yes. You need that to win a Super Bowl. I do like Only Only Murders, though. It's a good show. Number one. And the number one Steve Martin comedy that will always be number one for me is Dirty Rotten Wow. Scandals. Pretty good. Look at us. Michael Caine, Steve Martin. And it is a movie about people who scam each other and end up being both the scammer and the scammy. And as a person who enjoys... Both those Scamming. roles, <laughs> yes. that movie is number one. <laughs> Clearly, close to Samson's heart, a movie about scam artists. <laughs> if someone were interested in, in doing a Michael Caine impression, how do they go about it, And then, If you want to talk like Michael Caine, you must only say a few words at a time. <laughs> Nailed it. Wow. Adnan, no matter how bad your list is, that was amazing. <laughs> very, very slow. Oh, I'm watching the trailer to The Jerk right now. Dude. Yeah, I can't imagine that this holds up. <laughs> I'm telling you. There is no way. It holds up. Wait, it does. It does. It, does. it really does. It, it does. The yes. Jerk? It yes. does. It's, oh, it's hilarious, man. <laughs> All right. Good luck. And then, take it over, please. Uh. All right, number five. While, while Dominique watches the jerk, I will go with number five of Parenthood. Good. Samson, one of your favorite movies. That's not comedy, a comedy, charming. No, wait, pick oh, it's funny. a comedy, David. Stop. Thank you, Stu. Thank you, Stu. There's some dramatic moments in there, but that's a comedy, and it's funny, and it's charming. Parenthood would be in my top five of a Steve Martin, all time Steve Martin movies, but I do not view that as a comedy. There were moments in there oh. that made me smile, but more moments that made me cry. Uh, Go ahead. Um, be that as it may. Yeah. Father of the Bride. Thank you. It's <laughs> a great movie. Again, speaking of, speaking of only murders in the building, Martin Short, Stu, is Frank. I mean, the guy's <laughs> yeah. unbelievable. Amazing. He's still still the 90s, Mr. Yeah. Bonks. <laughs> can't, can't make that movie today. Well, they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they did. It was like, it was it's better. set in Miami, wasn't it? I, <laughs> it I was, saw that movie. Yeah. Yeah. It was like. Yeah. Yeah. Was that BT's? I think it was BT's. The remake of that just came out with uh, Andy Garcia and Gloria yeah. Stefan. Yep. Steve yeah, Martin, excellent. you know, Steve Martin, also yeah. a prop comic. <laughs> yeah. Number three, <laughs> Bowfinger. Yeah. Wow. That's my guy. I, I, I knew a movie. Like, this is <laughs> the most sucks, underrated right? Steve Martin Bowfinger? movie. Bowfinger? Bowfinger sucks. Bowfinger there is one tremendous. scene at the border that, uh, at the time, when we judge by the humor and moralities of the time, was actually quite funny. Bowfinger <laughs> is genius, but it is too yes. inside baseball. That's the problem. It's too, way too inside. 
No, that scene, I mean, where he says, one day I have a dream that a FedEx delivery guy will come and give me a package. And they do it in slow motion. <laughs> and the music's soaring at the end. <laughs> Hysterical. Eddie Murphy playing dual roles. Okay. Bowfinger Samson. Get, uh, underrated Steve Martin. Hysterical Did you movie. just add that to your list after the no, right I guy? Have, I, no, of course I didn't. My list is awesome. Don't be jealous. So far, I'm three for three. Parenthood, Father of Rive, Bowfinger. Yeah. It's going to get even better. Number two, L.A. Story. Come on. The first scene of a hot dog going by in the air. Him and Sarah Jessica Parker together. How do you spell Sandy? Big S, one small A, big N. That movie's hilarious, Samson. <laughs> L.A. Story, a great L.A. movie. Come on. And an L.A. Story may be in my top 15 of all-time movies. I just redid my top 100. <laughs> but L.A. Story, again, I don't view that as a comedy. That is a movie about a very serious situation with a man and his destiny. There's only three things, the miracles, the tree of life outside Bahrain, and this is the place where I met her. That was his ex-wife, Victoria Tennant, by the way. Great well, movie. It's listed as a comedy. a comedy. I'm on, it's a rom -com. according same, to the same, internet. Same, it's yeah. a rom-com. That's what I was gonna say. Comedy, drama, fantasy. Yep. And number one, fellas, this is easily the best. I, I'm shocked Samson did not have this on his list. It's a real no-brainer. Planes, it's trains, and yes, automobiles. Thank you. I've been, please, have mercy. I've been wearing the same underwear since Tuesday. I can vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> Those are like pillows. <laughs> <laughs> How about that Bears game? Hell the game. Hell the game. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen it too, guys. I, I love it. It's a great movie. <laughs> it's, the, uh, uh, awesome you've never seen Planes, Trains, and Automobiles? Nah, bro. What? I'm sorry. I know. Uh, I mean, I'm 40 years old. I guess I'm old, but I should have watched these movies apparently. But have you I seen any of the 10 movies? Yeah, I've okay. seen a couple of them. So the. Uh, uh, Three Amigos, right? right. That was okay. one of them. I've seen that. Uh, Bowfinger, mm -hmm. I've seen yeah. that. Um, I think there's a couple other ones in there that I might have seen, but... Uh, I've got my top five, which is curiously a nice blend of both lists. For someone that's respected as one of the greatest comedians... Uh, this IMDb is pretty weak. No, I mean, look, Ooh. he takes. He, he, he right, does not Mike. make good movies. No, 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 no. He misses way more than he hits. No, no, no. Steve Martin. He's a volume shooter for sure. Yeah. He's like Robert De Niro. Like you said, oh, Robert De Niro's a great actor. Look at his IMDb. Look at all these dud movies that he makes. But it's because he takes the checks. But when he puts his mind to it, he makes great movies. Here's my list, real quick. But De Niro has a Godfather on his list. Like, so he, he just, so he just yeah, decided Niro, to put his yeah. mind to it twice? Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. <laughs> okay, so at uh, OLI. I've got an OLI. The Man with Two Brains. These are not good movies. And Mel Mahay. Come on, man. These are not good movies. Like, oh, <laughs> you wildin'. Where's wildin'. Sergeant Bilko? Got it with Mike. Sergeant Bilko is terrible. Terrible. Terrible movie. Phil Hartman. Uh, Jeez. Number five. <laughs> Bowfinger. Yes. Number four, me. Three Amigos. Number three, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Yes. <laughs> number two, The Jerk. And number one, I guess this says a lot about my character. I, like David Sampson, love Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. It is the perfect movie. What, the perfect movie in terms of a story, in terms of hilarity, in terms of twists and turns. You can't make a movie more perfect than that. And one of my favorite things about that movie, there's a restaurant here in Miami called Poppy Steak. And when you go into the bathroom, they have a huge mural, for some reason, of Michael Caine and Steve Martin from that movie. I don't know why, but I love it. What was the impetus for the Steve? Is Steve Martin doing so? It's just because only it's murders, birthday. like what? Birthday. Steve Martin also. Only burgers in the building? <laughs> It's that we come up with things like today's Steve Carell's birthday. We could have done a top oh. five Steve Carell. No, you couldn't. No, I didn't know can. that. I always assumed that. Yes, you five. could. He doesn't have five. What yes, five? What five does he have? What? Oh, we will 40. find out Four. after the break. Wow. <laughs> I always assumed the point of this segment was to see if you could get which Jess or uh, Lucy to fall asleep. Uh, I think that's no. They're too busy on Etsy <laughs> right now. <laughs> working on something completely unrelated this entire time. Good for you. We've I wish I was with you guys. And also tweeting. I wish I was with you guys. <laughs> You've never seen any of these movies for real? Some of them. But you know, I saw like, a couple, like, he you said. Know, whenever, like, when, when Dominique says things like this, you know what I feel? Honestly, I'm like, poor kid, man. He was playing football the whole time. <laughs> had no time But if it watch. wasn't for that sweet white family that <laughs> yeah. took him in. <laughs> we were the lucky ones. <laughs> That's a winner.